<laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. I, this is my first time doing a live stream, so please forgive me if I am not on top of everything. <laughs> but we are here to discuss Lamez. I'm sure we all have lots of big thoughts about it. I know I enjoyed it. Um, it was really readable. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. I could not edit my description box after the first time because this is my first time setting up a live stream. So I will edit the description box after with, with all the information. So don't worry. Everything will be there for the next live streams, which will be in two weeks. So yeah. And I'll also the um, information for everyone's channels. All right. Does anyone want to talk about the book description so far? Or not description, but your experience so far? Christy, Victoria? Oops. Yes, sure. I know Victoria, <laughs> Victoria and I were both listening to the end part of this section on audiobook. So I'm curious how our experience is related. I really I loved it. I was so nervous going into it because I wasn't in a good headspace for like depressing things or like really hard to read things, but I just like instantly loved it. So it carried me along really well. It's so readable. Like, I don't know, it, feels, it sounds depressing, but it's just so easy to read. Yes, so true. It's so character driven, you know? Mm hmm. Just taking a picture <laughs> for Melanie. <laughs> yes. Oh, she just disappeared. Okay. <laughs> that won't help. You're, you're responding to her. Awesome. <laughs> Melanie is having some internet troubles. So we're hoping that she can come in a little bit later, but she's traveling around in her band in different countries. So, which sounds mm -hmm. super fun. <laughs> yeah, right? Living the life. <laughs> Internet struggles are real for that, though. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Victoria? Well, yeah, I would say I agree. I, I just love the writing is gorgeous. I just love, like, the sentence structure, everything. <laughs> like, I just love it. It's, it's been such a beautiful read. And um, I love how he, he really paints, like, he really sets the scene. Like, I just feel like he knows how to set the scene and he really goes in depth with the characters as, you know, as much as he wants to. <laughs> and I know some people have complained about that with Hugo. Like he gives like too much detail sometimes, but honestly, I haven't even felt that way. Like I've totally loved the details and I just love how he kind of sets the tapestry and, um, I'm just, yeah, I'm just adoring it so far. I, I predict it will be a new favorite classic for me. It's It's been going really well. I've loved it. I, I think when I first started, I was like, I don't understand what we're reading, but I'm enjoying it nonetheless. <laughs> I was like, it's just so, so great. And last summer I read War and Peace, which prepped me for like the bulk of this book. Okay. And so I was like, this is going to be dense, but I'm okay <laughs> with it because I've read War and Peace. I feel like that prepped me. And then reading this one, I was like, okay, I'm ready for the sad moments, the hard moments, the like war moments, because I feel like that's going to come up partially in this. But I'm also like, I'm ready because I think it's going to be beautiful. And it is. I'm happy with the side trails and the the different things with the bishop I was like that's okay I love that because it just prepped me for this tale of morality too because I feel like that's such a big theme in this so far yeah yes he has such Definitely. a heart for the suffering people <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah I would say the ones that I the only descriptions that I've struggled with is like the chapter on 1817 and he just kind of like gives you a bunch of history and pop culture of France at the time. And like that whole chapter was just like a laundry list of, of like things that were happening in France at the time. And I was just like, wow, I don't have enough background for this to follow it, but everything else has been pretty good. <laughs> no, it's been so interesting. And the characters that we've seen are so developed like he develops them so well for us. I feel like I can see them in my mind's eye. Even with a few short sentences of like Javert, like he's just so prominent in my head. 
Oh yeah, <laughs> Javert. Yes, he's a great <laughs> character. From the moment he was introduced, I could picture him. Not from the movie, but from like the book's perspective. Mm hmm. Yes, definitely. There's so many. This this book is so quotable too. I see a few people putting some quotes. Jay, it's there's just so many like very quotable moments in this book. Yes, mm -hmm. so true. That's a great one. Yeah, the guillotine quote was interesting. I loved that quote. That was the first thing I tagged in the book about the guillotine. Yes. Jay said this was his favorite book. I think, did you say favorite? Yeah, one of my favorites. Yeah. One or, of my favorites. <laughs> so great. Yeah. I can see why. Like, it's. It's, it is very long, and he did warn us at the very beginning that, you know, this character has nothing to do with the plot, basically. But, like, <laughs> I, loved, I loved him, so that was okay. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I love this, too. The, the details of the list of expenses. <laughs> like, yeah. Everything is so important. <laughs> so true. Hugo yeah. really wants to give you a full picture of, of, of the character's in-depth life. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It kind of reminds me of the Count of Monte Cristo because, like, you get side plots in that before you actually need to know the like the person. You're like, why am I reading about this person? And then you get to the part where you're like, oh, that's why this person's important. And that's so true with this book too. And it's like you'll get there. <laughs> it's like he was like, we'll get there. Just just read with me. We'll get there. Really, I kind of you know, shortchanged himself in the beginning when he was like, well, really, this character is not going to be important, but we're going to talk about him. And I'm like, you know what? Actually. He is super important though, because he's mm -hmm. super important to understanding Jean Valjean and what he goes through. So I actually was like, Hugo, don't sell yourself short. <laughs> 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 the bishop is important. <laughs> yeah, he sets up the whole stage for Jean Valjean's change in like life, his course of action. Mm -hmm. I would say he's important, but it, like he's backstory, but it's important. <laughs> yeah. No, it was uh, funny. I was reading this while I was getting Telus put in, and so I was just reading my big, thick classic while I was like Telus guy. Was was happy. In. <laughs> yeah, I was just sitting there while the Telus guy was putting in uh, the the wiring, and I feel like it was looking a little funny, but I was just sitting there enjoying. You know, the whole storyline of especially Fantine at that point, it was just so heartbreaking and like the way it went. And I loved also how we see Jean Valjean, that we see the mayor. And if you don't know from a, like watching an adaptation, you don't know that they're the same person. And then later it's like, in case you didn't know, they're the same person. <laughs> he I'm sure you it. figured it out by that. By There's a lot side. of hints up to that point, but it's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I carried my copy on a plane, so I, I could not fit it in the front seat pocket of the plane. <laughs> Lucky. This is great. It's like such a, you know, strict law or innocent woman. and Yeah, I think yeah. They, they may not have been as strong of archetypes when he was writing. Like, he may have been helping create the archetypes. <laughs> But he was such a social commentator because that's like why he wrote the Hunchback of Notre Dame. So, yes, yes, he's very much it's like good. Dickens in that way. Yeah, it's part of There's his. Ro oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Kersey. I, I think it's. I I could be mistaken. I think it's part of his romanticism. Like it's that's it's social commentary, especially about the plight of the poor, is part of that. A lot of times he wrote like a romantic manifesto, Victor Hugo did, um, basically sort of outlining what that kind of literature does and what it's concerned with. Um, yeah, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, neat. He was like the height of the romantic movement in France. Mm. Definitely write, knows how to write big books. <laughs> I will say yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same way Gris, Griselle, Griselle, I think is the name. Um, 
Yeah, I'm I'm honestly I'm not struggling through it at all. I'm just loving it so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like when you break it down into volumes, it definitely loses the the scary feel. Like it looks big at the first action, and then you're like, it's actually pretty manageable. <laughs> I know some of people love it as some of their favorites. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, Jay, Jay asked if we like the movie. Do you mean the 2012, like the newer movie, Jay? Because there's there's a, a lot there's a lot of additions now. <laughs> there's one with singing, and then there's an older one that's without singing. And I actually think that older one is better. It has like like Liam Neeson in it, or I forget all, and like Uma Thurman is in it. Whatever year that was made. Oh yes, I, really I think I've seen that one. one. <laughs> I like that one more than I even like the musical. Hmm. I I remember mm -hmm. watching that one at one point. I don't remember much about it. And then the first movie I ever saw in theaters was by myself was the 2012 one. Like I went to it by myself and it was so crazy. <laughs> I saw it at like 11 o'clock at night and it was just so impactful by myself. <laughs> so that was a great one. But my sister went to see it and she was like, um, it was actually funny because she's not a musical person. And she said, um, it would be so much shorter if they just talked the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so she was not a big fan of <laughs> It's not my favorite musical ever. I think there's some good songs, but it's not my favorite musical yeah. by far. But uh, I got to see it live at the Pantages in Los Angeles. So that was, um, that was amazing. It was actually the first musical I ever got to see live. So it has a special place in my heart for that reason. <laughs> And there's a, I was looking up a song from like Fantine's song that she sings when she's dying and I couldn't find it, but it looks like there's a 2018 series that was made on, cause I looked it up on YouTube and yeah. So I'm interested to go look up that one potentially to go watch that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I know Kaylee in the chat. She, in her videos, she said she wasn't a super fan of the musical either. <laughs> <laughs> I need to rewatch them. I'm excited to rewatch them. So there is a BBC miniseries as well. Oh, so maybe that's cool. the 2018 one, or maybe that's a different one. So wow. we'll have to do some watch alongs, maybe, or something. <laughs> we can all get our hands yes. on it. Good. <laughs> That'd be fun. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And yes, my sister would probably be more bored. <laughs> <laughs> She's not a big classics lover, my sister. But yeah. <sighs> Did anyone have anything of note from like sticky notes that they wanted to talk about? I mean, I had personally a lot of sticky notes. So <laughs> yes. it looks so small though, comparatively to the whole book. <laughs> it's just so tiny. What were you marking, Naomi? I was marking just things that I don't know popped up to me as so much so significant. Like um, the bishop, I think, was just so important in this section mm -hmm. when he's like talking to Jean Valjean and he's like, "Come on in." That was so important to me, you know. And then he's like, "Hey, you forgot, you know, the candlesticks, or you forgot what did you forget the candlesticks or the things?" And they're like, "Hey, he robbed you." That was such an incredible scene to me of like the mercy shown to him, and he's like. The whole time in that town, he'd been shown like such scorn, even though he didn't deserve it. And this whole society, yes. and it was just such an interesting. Not view. even the dog would take him in. I know, and it was like <laughs> this view on criminals, and it's just something we can, we still see in our society with like criminal record checks and like you know not showing that extra grace, and then later on also him kind of showing that to Fantine, where it's like you know, passing that on where it's like, if you're not completely moral, you can't work at the factory and then you're kicked out. It's just like a whole cycle. It was yes. just such an interesting theme to see throughout that whole volume. Yeah, he definitely had a lot to say about class and the prison yeah. system as well. And how I think the whole, the whole mercy that is shown to Jean Valjean is what changes him. And he, he'd spent 19 years in prison before that, which just hardened him, right? So I think it's a big critique on Hugo's part of the prison system in general, 
and just, you know, what is effective and what is not effective. And I think, I think Hugo probably would have, would have really thought that the prison system was not effective. <laughs> yeah. And it show, really shows how people are so judgmental, like, and keeps those uh, prejudices, prejudices in them. Yes, I have a quote about that very thing that I highlighted. He said, have no fear of robbers or murderers. Such dangers are without and are but petty. We should fear ourselves. Prejudices are the real robbers. Vices, the real murderers. The great dangers are within us. What matters is what threaten, what what matters it, what threatens our heads or our purses. Let us think only of what threatens our souls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so true. I'll put that in the chat. I think it's a little long, but. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a lot of social commentary in this book. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But I do enjoy his good social commentary, especially when it's weaved in a good story. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I love how that, I love how his his catalyst for change moment was written as well. I like we really really get to see Jean Valjean also like go back and forth. So his encounter with the little boy, right, with a little yeah. Gervais, um, we see how even though he's he's just had this like life changing experience, right, but then he's still struggling with himself and he's struggling with well, well, but I am a criminal and that's what the world expects me to be. And so he takes the coin from the from the little boy and then you know, he has this, this moral dilemma of like, but I just had this experience where someone showed, showed me mercy. And what am I going to do with that experience now? And I thought that was just so well done because you see how it's not like an instant change. It's, it's gradual because he still was kind of wanting to be a criminal again. Um, But he had to like wrestle with the the inner morals of himself first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So true. It definitely uh, rings true to the the character development that he had to go through. He can't just like flip that switch and be suddenly perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a process. Yeah. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed him showing that it that it was a process and it wasn't just that he changed immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm reading through my notes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many, so many notes. So many notes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And this is great. Like, morality isn't black and white. Like, the nun who never lied. That was great how she just lied suddenly twice in a row. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that was a great moment. <laughs> I'm alone. <laughs> I've never seen him here. <laughs> like... <laughs> so oh, and cool. I loved it. That part when um, the bishop, when it's talking about how the bishop reacts to different people and how he's talking to the materialist and he's like, oh, yeah, this materialism is such an excellent thing. You know, it's only for the rich and it's only for, you know, the great lords who have this special philosophy of their own and, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It was just like and he's it it was just great. It was great. It's like so much sass. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah no, there's so much wealth of stuff in this section uh. yes. and there was some chat in Victoria's discord about the discussion with the conventionist the who voted for um, the revolution in in the represent in the government um, and to end up killing the king. I loved that section too. <laughs> I'm not super knowledgeable on that part of history. So I was kind of intrigued. But I was also like, I am walking into waters I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm there with you. Yeah. Hi, Urza. <laughs> I did a little bit of a study on the French Revolution before this because I know that there's some sections about that in this book. 
he'll just go on to really long sections. I think it's a little bit later in the book where he's describing battles and stuff. And um, so I did a little bit of study on it. But I, yeah, it was very controversial at the time, I guess, what what the conventionists did, what they voted for to kill the king. So the priest mm -hmm. kept bringing up all of the things that were morally questionable to him and the conventionists just kept like having reasons for it that the priest couldn't necessarily combat because he wasn't a political creature and i just love that it's like yeah it's hard to sometimes um uh, have politics and morality in the same room <laughs> they don't mix very well yeah it's true. There's there's trouble with that sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything what do you else? Think of <laughs> Sorry, Victoria, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to ask, what do you guys think of Fan Fantine and her story as a character? What are your thoughts on Fantine? I kept thinking how uh, impressive it is that she was only in the movie for 21 minutes. <laughs> she still the the uh, Oscar. She made her um, character, but yeah, she she appears not for very long. <laughs> I know she is the catalyst for the book, though. I do think that she's quite the catalyst for the storyline. So <laughs> she really does show Jean Valjean that he needs to be more merciful, considering where he was at the beginning of the story, because. You know, he gets kind of up on his uppity horse and then he is corrected, I guess, by not showing mercy. However, um, her story was just so sad. It's like she's trying so hard and yet she has no other options when taking care of her daughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's definitely one of one of the miserables, right? She's one of the unfortunate. And she I think I think she embodies who the unfortunates are. She has no education. She has mm. no family ties. She is easily taken advantage of. And she also doesn't really see when people are taking advantage of her. And I feel like, I feel like as a character, she just represents those, you know, the people at, at the very bottom of poverty. And those are, those are the people that got, that get trampled on. I agree, Tammy, that he didn't know about her, but at the same time, he kind of moved from this being understanding of like his former situation to like being very like this is law, and that's what I think is the change. That's what I'm thinking of, and that's my perspective on it. Um, but I also have a perspective on the baby farmer situation, which is kind of what she did: is she gave her her child to baby farmers because I actually I've read a lot of true crime, which is about sometimes baby farmers where they take children in and they were used to be paid for it. This is like quite a common thing in history. And sometimes, a lot of the times, people would actually abuse the children from single mothers or like treat them poorly. And sometimes those children would actually be, in very, very rare cases, be killed because of it. But in this case, obviously, it's abuse and neglect and stealing the money. So it's not a rare or unfortunate case. It's actually quite a common thing. And these mothers had no way of knowing that their child was actually being mistreated. So this is actually showing light on another thing that was happening in society as well. This is happening all over the world. Like this was, I know stories of this in Australia, in England, like this was an all, all over the world situation. So it, it's another one of those social commentary things that's like, she had no way of knowing, and because of her lack of reading ability or lack of education, what could she do? Exactly. <clears throat> the potato brewerian, I think I'm saying that right. <laughs> Sorry if I'm not. They, she said, that's my first time hearing the term baby farmers. Same here. Me I've too. never heard that before. I've yeah. never heard that before. <laughs> it was actually a way to make money, so people would take in children and they would use that, they would make money from them. Oh. Like, it was actually a thing. And sometimes I mean, they would be, like, very rarely they'd be kind to them, but that was a thing. Yeah, so I sad. guess we would call that human trafficking now. Yeah, 
basically. And these mm -hmm. would be mothers who would have to pay for their child to be raised by someone else mm -hmm. because they could not get a job as a single mother. Uh, that's awful. Yeah. Yeah. Incredibly so tragic. The, it's would true you, for foster kids. Um, but that's a little more like government wise as opposed to. Um, yeah, this yeah, is a little a, different than fostering. It's a little <laughs> the, different. They were taking advantage of her. Hi, Melanie. Oh, Melanie. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Can you hear us? Hello. She must not be able to see us yet. <laughs> I'll tell her we can see her. Yeah. Try talking. We can see hey. you. <laughs> oh. Can you Hi. hear me all right? Yes. 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 Finally. <laughs> I made it. Woo. Hello. Welcome. Where did you say that you were right now? I think. There is a huge. <laughs> oh, there's like. Is there a delay. lag? Thank you. Yeah. So sorry for all that. Oh no! Oh, it's dropped her again. No. I'll let her know. <laughs> so with Fontaine, I think I I was really impressed by how. Victor Hugo portrayed her situation like so sympathetically. Um, he really understands like, you know, the intoxication of the morning of life, the adorable years, he says. I just love that. I think that's so like, yeah, when you're young, that that's what it's like. She was in love and that's actually just, <laughs> there's so many heartbreaking moments and that's really one of them for me. One is when Jean Valjean, steals the money from the boy and then the other one is when Fontaine gets abandoned and then later when she dies of grief and shock it's just like <sighs> yeah. yeah it's it's strange to me how Javert is so convinced that um Jean Valjean is the villain when like for stealing a little thing when he was what 19 or 20 whenever like back 20 years ago and yet he is so willing to walk into a woman's death room and be like your child's not here and i'm going to arrest this man right now and be super cruel about it and not have any respect for this woman and then like and basically shock her into death and have no remorse and think that he's still the good guy yes. mm -hmm. Like that black and white uh, mentality is just so strong. Yeah, he and, upholds yeah. The, he upholds the law without without thinking yeah. about what's right and wrong. It's just the letter of the law, right? That's how he lives mm -hmm. his life. It's the letter, not the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that showed in the courtroom when they were like, "We're just going to get a Jean Valjean, and we don't care if this person, you know." it claims to be someone else or has no evidence of actually being him or not. The courtroom scene is also very interesting. Um, Cause they talk about how like the person that was being accused of being Jean Valjean, who wasn't actually Jean Valjean was like not smart enough to know what was going on. It, it like Hugo mentioned a few times that he, he wasn't aware. Of, he wasn't really aware of what the situation was and so he was going to be convicted, but couldn't like defend himself very well. And so I feel like that was another critique of the justice system that Hugo is kind of slipping into it, slipping in there. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because he, they have brought out all these witnesses who clearly didn't know him. And they mm -hmm. were like, yeah, this is obviously the guy. And then, even after he, this guy's like, no, I'm Jean Valjean. They're like, oh, go get that man a doctor because he's obviously wrong. And they're like refusing to change their mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of showing the corruption of, of the system, just more of that. <laughs> I love too how Victor Hugo takes everything to like the extremist extremes to make his point where it's like so hard, say for... 
um, Jean Valjean to like get to the trial. He has to keep overcoming thing after thing after thing. And only if he has the utmost strength of purpose. Hi, Melanie. Oh, yeah. to the trial. He has to keep overcoming thing after thing after thing. And only if he has oh. the utmost strength <laughs> of purpose. Oh, yeah. We did like <laughs> yeah. It's, I'm still, I'm it's, still, I, I'm able to listen, but I can't, I, I think the camera is not working. Um, and I have a bit of a delay, so it's, it's hard to jump in, but I, I am listening and uh, you were making a very valid point that Hugo, once he takes a topic, he'll go to the fullest of it. Like, <laughs> just the yes. year 1817, like. <laughs> Yes, 100%. <laughs> He's in Melanie read Hunchback with me. So she she experienced that there as well. <laughs> and then in the trial where it was like so clear that he was going to be that the yes. wrong guy was going to be convicted, you know? Like every what like what you guys were really saying every yes. Yes. I like think every the is might be quite a delay. <laughs> Poor Melody. <laughs> All right. Um Let's see. I'm just looking at the comments, and yeah, Tammy, Tammy, I, I think I, I agree. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have turned a blind eye if he knew the specifics of Fontaine's situation. I feel like in the book, it wasn't like Jean Valjean fired Fontaine. It was more like she, like down the ladder, she was let go. It didn't seem like he even like really knew the situation or like knew who she was. So yeah, that's how I read it at least. Yeah, I was just uh, trying to type out a comment as the conversation was about something else. <laughs> but yes, um, I think I think it's right because I think Victoria's right because he wouldn't have done that if he had known. But then again, he's not in a position where as like the head boss to know all the workings of all the lower people. Right, and I think yeah. he's also set this idea up in his company where everyone has to be 100 percent moral all the time. And where this kind of idea that she has a child from a previous relationship could actually hinder her in regards to someone firing her over a previous relationship that she's not engaging in now um, actually then gets her in trouble now. So I think the culture that has been set up in a way creates that idea. And it's not just his culture, it's the whole culture of like the society because of that whole like right versus wrong. And if you do one thing wrong, then suddenly you're like, you know, a convict for stealing an apple, right? You're gonna go to jail for life if you steal an apple and someone thinks you're a wrong person. Like, you know, a mistaken identity. Or if you've had a child from a previous relationship and everyone thinks that that's completely wrong, then you get fired and you can't recover from that in your society. So it's not just his culture that he's created in his work environment, but it's also everyone's culture. So it's not just like his choice, but it's the world's environment at that point. Uh, particularly for women as well. I mean, we, we, do see, we do see also how women get consequences that the men don't. Like the man, the man who attacks Fontaine, um, she's the one who ends up getting consequences and the man does not. So we, we also see the, you know, the injustices there with the gender dynamics. Mm -hmm. People felt the need to punish iniquity and it's kind of like, yeah, I, I feel like they're being punished enough by the time you even know about it. Like you don't have to punish somebody who's already just so downtrodden and suffering. It's like you're kicking a puppy. They're already down. Mm -hmm. And from the little I know about pre-French Revolution from like Marie Antoinette time, they were very poor already. Like the poor were so poor and the rich were so rich that 
they didn't have much to begin with. And from what we've already read, like Fantine was already like starving herself or like lacking so many things. Like it did say like she went without fire for winter because of her trying to send all the money she could for her daughter. So as much as like she's going without so much, I think there's really, you kind of understand how they just keep going poorer and poorer. And then one little slip up makes everyone else be like, us versus them means kind of a little more for me, right? Like if I turn my back on this person, then maybe I get a little more money because I get a job at the factory in place of Fontaine. Or like, I don't know, that kind of switch up. It's very much fight for yourself because at least in my mentality, my thinking, there's no other way to survive in that kind of world. Well, I think the Tenardiers are a good example of what you're talking about, Naomi, as far as like trying to get ahead in the world and just looking out for yourself. And, you know, they're working class people. So they have the, they like the Tenardiers are interesting because they have the facade of being honest, hardworking people who make a living through their own hands and everything. Um, and they have this, and even Fontaine sees you know, she sees them and she's like, oh, like your children are well taken care of. Like, you know, they, they look like an upstanding household. And then there's this ugly underbelly there as well. Of just because they are they are in the working class, there does not make them moral. It does not make it does not make them, you know, yeah, morally upright because they have this this this, you know, kind of just self-serving um way of the world of way of getting along mm -hmm. yes the appearances can be deceiving yeah. theme is very big here and also very big in hunchback <laughs> oh really <laughs> the main yeah it's one of the main themes in hunchback <laughs> ah <laughs> I read Hunchback as an abridged version, like a kid's abridged version a while ago, and I didn't really enjoy it, but I would probably read it again after reading this first section, just based on how I'm enjoying this one so far. This one's been calling to me for a while, so I'm glad I picked it up. <laughs> yes, we are too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hunchback is very beautiful as well. Like, There's a lot of similarities in the style and themes. Cool. Yes, For some Donna. reason, Hunchback intimidates me more than Lame is because I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't, but it does. <laughs> so well, that, I don't that remember. Me feel better about reading Hunchback someday. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just so sad. Like <laughs> Lame is is really sad, and I I don't know what happens at the end, but I feel like there's maybe more hope to Lame Miss, whereas Hunchback. There's not a lot of hope. Like, it's pretty okay. just, it really shoves it at you. It's really sad. Like, oh, I cried a lot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I see. Oh, yeah. Tholome I don't know how you pronounce it, but the guy Tholome that dropped Fontaine. Tholome yes. yes. <sighs> yeah. yeah. Well, they, they are the worst yeah this group of guys who just like dates these lower class women and then just drops them because it's not of any consequence to them you know what happens yeah. to the women it yeah this is so awful was, we're gonna go be moral now <laughs> yeah our parents By abandoning like, you guys you. <laughs> our parents want us to come home so we're going home now <laughs> it's like yeah right <laughs> sure you are and that's again another situation where the males have it easier in, in this yeah. time for sure. Yeah. Well, especially the rich men have it easier. Like they just have it all made and they can just walk away at any time. And they, he doesn't have to claim parentage for Cosette. He doesn't have to give her money for her ever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and we also see, we don't really find out what happened to the other three women. But we see that it affects Font. I think we are we are to assume that it affects Fontaine the most, and that the other the other three women maybe it doesn't, you know, it doesn't affect them as much as it affects Fontaine, who's 
less fortunate than them because mm -hmm. he he mentions like Fontaine laughs along, but then she goes home and you know her 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 life is ruined basically. Whereas I think with the other three women, we don't we don't get that perspective, or at least we aren't really told what happens with no, them. No, they're like, oh, what a good joke. Of course, yeah. she laughs with them, so we don't really know how they really feel, like if they're actually yeah. feeling that way or what. But Well, we also I aren't told up until the end of that section if that she has Cosette. So they could have kids too. Yeah, like, exactly. We don't even know. And I think the main reason I kind of took away from that, that we get told Fontaine's story, for, story from it is because it's directly related to Jean Valjean. Like, right. Because she's so integral to his story. So, like, that's why we get told her story because then she has Cosette and then Cosette's integral to his story. So maybe that's why we don't get told their story because it's not important to Jean Valjean's story. But it's sad because yeah, yeah. then there's these three other women who they could be out there also in the same position. They might have their own stories. <laughs> you never know. But he, Hugo probably wouldn't tell their stories unless it ended in tragedy. <laughs> I mean, that's very possible. They could be career mistresses. Mm -hmm. You never know. She did seem the most, Fontaine did seem like the most naive out of all of them, but they would never share it if they really were vulnerable. Like, that's mm -hmm. not really something they would talk about with each other. <sighs> mm hmm they seem kind of like a clique that just, and they just drop Fontaine, you know, when she can't keep yeah. up anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't remain That's friends or anything, yeah. Yeah. That was their type. <laughs> kind of mean girls clique. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. We are also told that, you know, Fontaine genuinely loved Ptolemy's yeah. So yeah. She, like she wasn't just on the surface like hanging out with them like the other three women were. She was actually like, you know, believed that they were in love. Yeah. Yes. Which yeah. Was not That's... a good thing to believe. No. Again, with the contrast where he takes it to the extreme, you know, the beautiful day, setting it up to be a perfect day, and then like the worst possible. Worst possible thing for Fontaine. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. That is a stylistic thing. I wonder if that's part of the romantic. So a part of, I think part of the romantic literature thing is to get your feels all towards, you know, one thing, your expectations all up, and then to just break your heart. <laughs> I think that's a, thing of the romantics i think that's part of their thing i would believe that <laughs> they it want definitely to make you feels emotional. true to the book right now doesn't it every time we get a high we get a low <laughs> mm -hmm. but i love the highs and i still love the lows yes so. every time i keep reading or start reading i want to keep reading yes it's so poignant mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually found out I have two audiobooks. I didn't realize I had bought two of them, so I'm not sure which one I'll continue reading. I might try the other one, see if I like the translator better, although the other one's still good. So. Oh, nice. Now, which ones are you reading? Which um, translations? I won by uh, Julie something. <laughs> I've never heard of this one before, but I got one on Chirp, so mm -hmm. that was nice. And I can't figure out the translator on this one, so... It's okay. by, oh, it's translated by Charles E. Wilbur. So that one, it's read by a man. The other one's read by a woman, I think. So. Okay. I think I might be reading the Wilbur one too. Yeah. Um, yeah, this one is translated by, let's see, Julie Rose. So oh, two nice. translations to pick from. We'll see. I At think I just audio. picked the one 
Yeah. <laughs> I think I just made sure that I had an ebook that matched my audiobook. So I forget what translator it was, but I just made sure they matched and that was the main thing for me. Mine don't match. I found a matching oh. one for I found a matching one for this. It's Isabel Hapgood and I found a matching audiobook oh, for that. Yeah. Carla's mm -hmm. reading that one too. I think that's the one that I read for Hunchback was Isabel Hapgood. Yeah, all of mine have different translators, so I'm trying to figure out which is the best way to read it succinctly because mm -hmm. I like to do all three different methods. So I might just jump to the other audiobook and see if that works for my ebook. But we'll see. I wonder if Melanie can communicate through the chat with us. <laughs> I'm intrigued to know if you notice any differences in the translations. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very yeah. excited to know if you, if you notice any differences in all the translations. Like, I haven't well, tried to, but I will take a look next time. Melanie, you're reading it in French, right? I think she is. Also, Carrie, um, Carrie was reading it in French as well and comparing the two and she was putting in the discord about um, some interesting, interesting things that kind of are standing out to her in the French, in the French edition. So I've enjoyed yeah. seeing her comments, particularly also you? I found it interesting with Vu and Tu and yeah. when that's used and, you know, showing disrespect when you say Tu to the wrong person <laughs> or, oh, you know. <laughs> mm hmm. So That's hard to translate. <laughs> I know that Shakespeare does that too with like when he says vow and you, it means something different. I can't remember oh. which one is which, but when Shakespeare does it, it means something as well. So, yeah. It's interesting yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> it's Hopefully awesome. next time it'll be better. Yeah, hopefully she won't be traveling. I really want to hear her thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah. I know. But yeah, I think Melanie was reading in French. That was her yeah. plan. <laughs> it seems like a lot of people had read the um, gang, the version where they take certain things out. I forget what that's called. Um, okay. And so I think she had read that version where he, they had taken certain things out of the book and made it shorter. Um, so the, I, I'm not sure she's read the whole, the whole thing before now. So this might be her first experience going through it. I'm not sure though. <laughs> Abridge, thank you. Yes, words, they're escaping me. This is what uh, Carrie is saying about the thou and you. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Oh, Christine Donna. I, I don't know how you pronounce it, but that one, I really wanted to read that one, but this version was free. So, <laughs> and it's really good though. I really am enjoying this one. Also, if anyone's um, watching and they don't have an audiobook, I did link LibriVox down in my uh, description of my announcement video, and you're wanting an audiobook. So, if you're needing a free audiobook, I haven't listened to it though, so I don't know the quality. Words are <laughs> <laughs> <See> you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and here's an interesting thing. When he says two to Valjean, it doesn't respect him anymore. Mm. It's strange because he had suspected um, Valjean before, or but he so he respected him, but he suspected him before. And he thought that he wasn't. And that scene where he's like, I only know someone who did this. And he was a convict. It was like, he's on to him. And yet he still respects him. I well, found that scene he so interesting. <laughs> he only yeah, respects he him to. on the surface. Yeah. So it's, it's just, just an outward, yeah, but an not, outward not. veil. <laughs> <laughs> a veiled words to say. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's um, Jean. Well, he's Madeline. M M Madeline is his boss. Is Javert's yeah. boss? So he has to be formal with his boss. Mm -hmm. 
but then but then you know when he has when he has the the big reveal that it's actually Jean Valjean then we see then I guess we see two in the French version mm -hmm. but yeah we lose we lose those little details when we read in English <laughs> yeah I think we also lose that in like time and date like our time and age in our culture and difference we don't truly understand that unless you understand that when it comes to like the thou and you because they try to get it in their translation sometimes at the same time you don't you don't understand it's like oh they just chose a different word it's like but we don't get it <laughs> yeah my my edition tried to say thou sometimes and it doesn't work the same way yeah it's because we don't we associate thou with like old language not with formal so yeah i was like what why is it saying thou suddenly <laughs> anyone else have other thoughts <laughs> there was so much meat in here but i'm also like drawing a blank on what else to talk about <laughs> i feel like we covered so much already yes yeah. I think um, just throwing more onto the thematic fire here, <laughs> he says, how much, uh, I, I forget who was saying this. Let me see who was saying it. Um, it. He was saying, how much men are like the nettle. My friends, remember this, there are no bad herbs and no bad men. There are only bad cultivators. I think it might've been the bishop, but I love that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that does take away all responsibility for sure from the individual but <laughs> it's still a nice thought <laughs> I think that's part of the theme of the book and part of the romantics yeah. mm -hmm. is to show how bad the situations are for people and to always have and you know to try and understand and give them the benefit of the doubt Yes, I loved everything about Monsignor, Bien Monsignor Bienvenu. Yeah, the bishop was great. <laughs> yes. He's the pinnacle of, like, the, I the ideal clergyman who actually, like, is genuine and actually cares for the poor people and lives mm -hmm. that way as well. And I loved when he was introduced and he saw the hospital and he was like, I think we got the wrong houses. And everyone's like, no, we didn't. And he's like, no, we're going to switch. <laughs> it was, like, it's so brilliant because it just shows at that point his character, which is then like amplified when he is like, you didn't steal from me. It just truly shows then, you know, that's the first sign at his, at his compassion and kindness for the poor and those are people he doesn't even know. And you know, he's like just showing it before to us, like Hugo showing it to us at mm -hmm. the very beginning. Yeah, he actually lives his religion, like actually does. <laughs> it's not just lip service, right? So yeah. we, we see someone who actually lives it. And then when the lady's like, no, go to that door and knock, it's because she knows that he'll actually get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that moment too. She's like, knock over there. <laughs> Go <Yeah>. over there. <laughs> he's such a contrast from the, is he a bishop? I don't know. He's some kind of priest in Hunchback. I can't remember now. But um, and in the beginning, that priest, he has some good qualities. But um, as you know, in the movie, the priest becomes, he's not a priest in the Disney movie, but in the book, he's a priest. Um, and he kind of becomes the opponent of all that is good. So it's nice that in this case, that is not what happens. <laughs> yeah, we get the opposite. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's funny. This is a great question, <laughs> turning himself in or not. That was quite the internal debate before yeah. his way to go. Yeah, that's a that is a, a great device, I think, on Hugo's part. Um, because there's so much he can lose so much either way, right? If he if he turns himself in, he's he's not gonna be able to do the good work he can do anymore because you know his identity is revealed. But if he doesn't turn himself in, then an innocent man is taking his place, right? 
So it's really a, another moment where we get to see him make the moral decision. And he, you know, he has to decide like which of these paths, like it's going to be bad for me either way, but which is better for other people. And, you know, he chooses, he chooses to save the individual, the innocent man over like his, his own identity and his own like moral standing in the community. So yeah, it's just another opportunity for us to see his true character. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting because he had that same kind of internal debate before he even left. Like in his warehouse, he was like, I, am I Jean Valjean? Am I the mayor? What am I like doing? I have these jobs with these people, but if I am no longer the mayor, what do I do? Because Javert has caught me, like he's confronted me. Now what do I do? So he had that before and then he goes to the courtroom and then it's like, now what do I do? I'm now like, he had this whole internal debate for so long and it really comes down to he had to make the choice of whether to make the, let this man go to prison for life or mm -hmm. you know give jobs to all these people and keep his reputation mm -hmm. and it's a great discussion <laughs> and it's also a great discussion on the whole society because he also had done nothing wrong at that point and yet they were determined to catch Jean Valjean, whoever he was, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, it's crazy. It's crazy how how like the whole community, which already know the community knows him, right? And they have reaped the benefits of him helping them, and still they're willing to like turn on him in a second. So it's quite vicious. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That's so interesting because like when you see a character like Monsignor Bienvenu, uh, you kind of feel like he he's almost like a Gandhi, you know, but in France. Um, and you think, oh man, that's so like idealistic. But then he still has he shows so much of the hard edges of life. <laughs> and again, I think that's part of maybe the romantic style. Um, you show everything in the extremes. So you have the extremely good, and then you have the public who is in, in the public who just turns instantly as a mass, you know, against him. Um, even though there are like a few, you know, people who are still loyal to him. And then you have people who are struggling with those two extremes, like like Jean Valjean, who um was never really a bad guy <laughs> like he was he made some very poor choices um earlier on in his life but um you really see him struggling with the decision of whether to turn him himself in like you guys were just talking about it was a great a great kind of back and forth that he was having with himself um where he had to decide what is the right thing here <laughs> so i feel like victor hugo really does show like a range you know of shades of morality um but he does the romantic thing where he shows them all very strongly you know the the two ends yeah. mm -hmm. oh hey yeah, megan oh, hi megan <laughs> hi megan <laughs> I think it definitely starts, like Melanie says, as well from the beginning. Like he's never truly settled with his own self and like when he's trying to hide himself. Because he's always trying to hide, you know, being Jean Valjean until he's like, okay, this is me and I'm going to do what I need to do and I'm going to take care of Fantine until the end. And then I'll face the consequences. Mm hmm. And we see that he, when he escapes prison, that's another decision that's not necessarily like, you know, you're not letting justice just take its course. Like he's like, this is unjust and I need to, I forget, I think I know what he does after that. I, I feel like I didn't read that section about Waterloo. So maybe I didn't go to the right spot. So I don't know what he does after that, but I have a feeling he's not just gonna let himself be caught, you know? <laughs> Well, the next section is called Cosette, so, and it's a pretty big book. So we'll see what happens next. Yes. Yeah. No, 
they were out for a, a witch hunt and they wanted the one person. They didn't care who they got. Yeah, man, it was a very interesting way to end that section, wasn't it? Like the whole courtroom scene and then Fantine dying, which was very sad. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we're fifth of the way through now. Woo! <laughs> only a hundred or only a thousand pages left to go, at least in our yeah. in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> we got this. Oh, we totally have it. <laughs> at least the way we've been reading it, I think it's so easy to read now. I'm very excited. I'm loving it. I hope I hope all of you are loving it too. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Me too. gonna be great yes so does anyone else have any final prompting questions to discuss in the comments then here yes tammy she never got to see because that again which was heart-wrenching because that's the only thing she wanted yes so sad yeah yeah he's only in the first 20 percent of the book says megan <laughs> mm -hmm. which I think it's just crazy because she is actually a jumping point for the rest of the book. Yep. Considering that her daughter's Cosette and that's really where the rest of the book I think takes off, at least from my memory of the adaptation. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like she's, she's our first, ex our first, well, one of our first examples of just the downtrodden. Right. And we like, we mm -hmm. get a personal story of someone who's downtrodden enough to even sell their own hair and teeth. Like mm -hmm. she's the bottom, right? She's the bottom of the social classes. So um, she's kind and of- And all her descriptions of brushing her lovely hair because it brought her joy. It was like, oh, so sad. Because <laughs> like I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Shauna's thinking you, Naomi. <laughs> oh. I'm so glad that we all read it together. I have been holding on to a copy of it for at least 10 years. So I've been wanting to read it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> and we get to discuss it four more times. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, should we talk about the 24-hour readathon thing at all? Totally. Let's. <laughs> it's your idea. You go for it. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Well, we're thinking of doing like a lamest 20 themed 24 hour readathon where we can all read it together and have a live show. And yeah. So if you're interested in that, it'll probably be in August. We're not, I don't, I, don't, I need to still settle on the date. I think, I think we're okay with our date, but we're going to wait a little bit longer before we announce which which day we're going to do it. So yeah, but it'll be coming up in August. So Woo. it's just so that we can get a jump start on our reading together. <laughs> and help us get through any of the tough parts because we might be yes. feeling a little lull at that point. <laughs> the halfway yes. mark. Yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> it'll help <laughs> us get through the tough parts. Yeah. Like you said, because well, as we've funny. seen, like the beginning was a little bit harder to read. And then at a certain point, you just start flying. Like it's, it was easy to binge at a certain point. So yeah, mm -hmm. there are certain points that are tougher than others. <laughs> Once Jean Valjean was introduced, I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if anyone needs any encouragement based on my War and Peace experience, I do know that things do get tough. But I do think it's going to be so worth it. And I do think also Fantine is a great experience of in, like a woman who is very complex in a book. So I think we're going to see a lot more complex women, which is strange to see in classics because some classics we don't see complex women. So I'm excited to see how Cosette turns out as a woman in this book. I think it'll be great. So her yeah. section's next. So that'll be fun. At yeah. least her name section's next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then Victoria also has the whole reading schedule if we want to follow it in her Discord already. Yep. So we can follow that if we want to. Unless you want to just fly through it like I know a couple of people have because they're <laughs> loving it. Oh, I know Stephanie said she's already read like to the end of cassette. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
I might pick it up this weekend and just see as much as how far I can and basically. And Epitine, yeah. Or Eponine? Eponine. I'll see how it goes on the audio. <laughs> see how I listen to it. But yeah, no. It'll be great, I'm sure. Yay. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Can Naomi. Wrap this up? <laughs> thank you. Yes, Thanks thank you, Naomi. Reading this with me, everyone. I know everyone is committing to a big project, but we'll have fun. And thanks yeah, for yeah. Christy and Victoria and Melanie for reading this and hosting with me. <laughs> and the yes. struggles, Melanie, for trying to get on. I know it's hard. <laughs> Hopefully she can come next time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, then we will sign off until the 31st. And all of the information will be in the description box for um, after this. I'll edit the description box. So we will see you all next time and on Victoria's Discord. Until then. Woo. Okay. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. Bye.